Hi everyone, my name is Jen. I'm an author and a book reviewer and behind me you can probably spy Sleepy Lola. Today, as you will have been able to see from the thumbnail, we're here to talk about lots of books and I hadn't realised quite how many until I got them off the shelves and off my book trolley and put them down on this table and thought, oh, that's a fair few books. So I did my last wrap up at the end of January. So in this video, I'm gonna be wrapping up, briefly reviewing all the books that I read in February and March. There are, I think, 48, oh, bye, are you going? Oh, well, that didn't last long, did it? Um, I think that there are 48 of them. I just had to stop the camera there because Lola decided that what she actually wants to do is sleep on my lap throughout this video so that's just an an added challenge to filming but we love a challenge this is a very chaotic introduction i'm sorry okay let us begin again i read 48 books in february and march a couple of those are dnfs i'm going to go through all of those in this video quite briskly because otherwise we're going to be here for a very long time but before I do that I want to talk about my quarterly stats so the first quarter of this year how many books I've read what categories those fall into I have a spreadsheet where I record my reading and some stats that I want to keep track of and I also use Storygraph and I combine both of those things I will maybe even insert some pie charts as we go now I get asked this question a lot as to whether I include DNFs in my reading stats at the end of the year and I have a rule my own rule you do whatever works for you but what works for me is that if I'm near the end of a book and I DNF it I do include it in my books read if I started a book and really wasn't getting on with it and thought this is really not for me I don't include it in my reading stats I'll talk about it in um, wrap ups and stuff saying why I passed on a certain text but I don't count it towards final figures. That's just what makes sense in my head. All right, so, so far this year, in 2023, I have read and completed 60 books. Let me refer to this notebook. 93% of the books I've read so far this year have been in print form, 7% in audio. Storygraph tells me that my top moods are reflective, emotional, dark, and mysterious, which doesn't surprise me at all. I've read 80% fiction, 20% non-fiction, and roughly 14,000 pages. And I have read from 23 different countries. Now the stats that I keep track of, 31% of the books I've read so far this year have been translated. 45% of the books I've read this year have been by writers of colour. 15% have been by disabled writers. And 69% of the books that I have read are from small presses. I also keep track of, um, let me scooch back, if Lola will let me, so I'm centre again. Um, I also keep track of the year that I acquired the books because um, I thought that might be an interesting thing to record, um, maybe less interesting for you. But perhaps not surprisingly, the majority of the books I've read so far this year, because I am a book reviewer and that is my job and I review for different outlets, the majority of the books I've read so far are from this year. So 27 of them were from 2023, 18 from 2022, three from 21, four from 20, one from 2019, 2016 and from 2009 so we had a proper backlist title in there um well backlist as in it came onto my shelves a long time ago and then also because i did a reading vlog where i read some of the oldest books on my tbr we have five books that i read from 2018 so those are the stats that i thought i would share with you if you want to share any of your stats in a comment down below i would love to hear about them did <laughs> you hear that very squeaky bike outside right so we have 48 books to talk about today. Some of these books I read in reading vlogs and I will link the relevant reading vlogs in the description box down below if you would like to go and take a look at them. And some of them I didn't read for reading vlogs at all. It's a bit overwhelming and I'm not really sure where to start. Maybe I should start from the beginning of February. I think this pile of books is the first set of books that I read in this time period. So at the beginning of February, I decided to do a reading vlog where I revisited my most anticipated books of the last few years, and then picked a book from each year to read. So that is what I did, and I had mixed results. The first one was Now She's Witch by Kirsty Logan, which came out in January. 
This is a novel about a woman called Lux, whose mother has recently died, and then another woman called Else arrives on her doorstep and says, we should travel north together. She tempts her to join her on this adventure to search for witches and also to get revenge on a man who harmed her. If you've read Kirstie Logan's books before, you know what to expect. I listened to this one on audio and I think it is brilliant on audio. Kirstie narrates herself because there's a lot to do with fairy tale and folklore, which obviously has a history of oral storytelling. I think that it lends itself so well to audiobook form. So I would definitely recommend that. I would also recommend it for fans of The Sea Women by Chloe Timms. I think if you enjoyed that, you'd like this. And the other one that came out this year is A Spell of Good Things by Ayobami Adebayo. This one is about a young boy called Eniola who is from a family who don't have much money at all and a woman called Wuraola who is from a wealthy family. She's working as a doctor but the hospital doesn't have much money either and they live seemingly quite separate lives but it turns out that decisions they make have untold consequences for each other and it's a slow burn. There are lots of different characters. I felt as though I was not struggling at first, it just took a while to get completely captivated by it, but I'll tell you, once I was captivated, I was absolutely hooked, and the ending of this book just destroyed me. I review this one in written form for Toast, so I'll link that article in the description box down below. Other books that I reviewed in that video, we have Pilgrim Bell by Kavar Akbar. I like this, but I much preferred his debut collection, Calling a Wolf a Wolf. So if you haven't read his work before, I would recommend heading there. I also read this short story collection by Ali Whiteley called From the Neck Up. There are a couple of standout stories in here for me. The rest I didn't love quite as much. The Beauty, which is a novella by her, remains my favorite book that she has written personally. Um, I would recommend this for fans of Life Ceremony by Siaka Murata. I also read The Snow Collectors by Tina May Hall, and I recommend this for fans of Death in Her Hands by Tessa Moshveg. The beginning of those books, so similar, and they're both about women who are living alone in a forest with a dog, and it's snowing, and they think that someone's been murdered, and they're trying to work out if that's true, or if perhaps they are imagining things. I enjoyed both of them. I thought there were maybe one too many themes explored in this book, but I appreciated what it was trying to do in the writing on a sentence-based level. It's beautiful. I also read The Raptures in that video by Jan Carson, which is like The Sixth Sense meets Dairy Girls. I think that's the best way to describe it. It's set in a small town in Ireland where the children start to die and no one really knows what's going on. And then one schoolgirl, Hannah, starts seeing those children. They come back to her to talk to her. Writing style wise, I say if you like Rachel Joyce and Kara Spray, then I think that you would enjoy this. Next, let's go to the Women's Prize long list. And again, I'll run through these quite swiftly because I filmed a long reading vlog, reading and talking about them. So first off, this is my favorite. This is Children of Paradise by Camilla Gadrova, a short, sharp, slightly gross and disgusting book set at a cinema. I loved it. Then there are two books that I have put on pause and haven't finished reading. Once the shortlist is announced, if they're on the shortlist, I'm gonna continue reading them. I may finish reading them anyway, but that is just my current plan. So we have got Demon Copperhead by Barbara Kingsolver, which is a book that's a modern day redoing of David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. I'm very impressed by this book, but I'm not keen to pick it back up and read more. It feels very accomplished, but it's just missing that spark for me. Then I'm also part way through Rush, Rush? Fire Rush by Jacqueline Crooks, and this I'm listening to on audio. It's brilliant on audio because it's very lyrical. It's all about music. It has some music and singing in it, and it's about a woman called Yume in London in the 70s. It's about going to raves. It's about dub music. It's also about political movements. It's about police brutality and Jamaican heritage. There's a lot going on in this book. The next book was such a surprise for me. I say that because I'd read this or this previous book and not loved it. A sense of humour just didn't seem to connect and I thought that would be the same here and it was not, which was lovely. So this is The Dog of the North by Elizabeth Mackenzie. And the blurb, unfortunately, I think makes this book sound a little bit trite, you know, one woman's journey to discover herself and all of that. And this book is not trite. Once you start reading it, you really don't want to put this book down. You will race through it, I promise you. It is about a woman who is trying to find herself and she gets herself into all of these unbelievable scenarios and meets all of these ridiculous people. Um, but it also deals with some quite hard-hitting stuff as well. And I think that combination of humour and seriousness 
amplifies each of those things and I thought it was really really good. Next I read Cursed Bread by Sophie McIntosh which I liked, I thought it was very atmospheric but I didn't always feel like I was in safe hands and there's a fine line between having a book that explores truth and fiction and characters not knowing what's going on and then you as a reader not being sure if the author knows what is going on and sometimes I wasn't sure which side of the line I was on and that was very distracting. So aspects of this book I really liked, but overall wasn't sure. There were two books that I decided weren't for me from the long list, but I will read them if they are shortlisted. That's Pod by Lime Paul, which is narrated from the point of view of a dolphin. And then we've got Stone Blind by Natalie Haynes, which is all about Medusa. I was not, let me move books maybe before I start talking. I was not wholly convinced by Homesick by Jennifer Croft. Um, this book is a strange one. I know it was originally published in Spanish and then it was published as a memoir in the States with a very different second half, I believe, also with photos. And now it's been edited again and issued as a novel. Um, and the second half of this book was what lost me on this. And I don't know if that's the evolution of the text as a whole or, or what, but this one wasn't one of my favorites from the list. Neither was Black Butterflies by Priscilla Morris. I didn't really feel as though after reading a third of this book, I knew who these characters were. I felt held at a great distance and I wasn't sure that that was really the point of the book. There were a few things in here that I found a little bit cliched as well. So I decided to put that one down. I read Trespasses by Louise Kennedy. I actually listened to this one on audio, which I would recommend. And I did feel as though I had faith in the author all the way through this book. I felt very grounded as a reader. I felt like I knew who these characters were. Unfortunately, maybe a bit too much because I found it quite predictable. I predicted the end of this book very early on and that took away a lot of the enjoyment because yes, you want to be able to see where the story is going and try and guess certain things, but you also want to be surprised. And there was no element of surprise in here at all, which was a bit of a shame, but a very well-written book. And then we're nearly at the end of the women's prize books here. We have three books here that I adored. Wandering Soul by Cecile Pinn, which is about three siblings leaving Vietnam after American troops have left there. And they go from Vietnam to Hong Kong and they go across to the UK and start a new life there. Their parents and their other siblings are gonna go on a boat after them, but unfortunately their boat doesn't make it. This is a very layered book, which has lots of voices from different people and has been very much inspired by Human Acts by Hong Kong. It is the premise of the wandering soul, a soul who is wandering the earth because its body hasn't been found. A very harrowing read in places, but I thought that it was wonderful. Likewise, Memphis, a very difficult read in places, but absolutely amazing. This is by Tara M. Stringfellow, and it is following um, women, well, not just women, but primarily women throughout the generations, especially siblings, two sisters together. Obviously, it is set in Memphis, mostly. And Tara is a poet, which you can tell by the way that she writes everything sings off the page. It's about family pain and secrets and violence and every single word on these pages has earned their place. I thought that it was very accomplished. Oh, there are two more women's prize books to talk about, not just one. Plus there are some others that are on the long list that I read prior to this reading period. I'm only talking about the ones that I read in February and March. So two of my favorites were I'm a Fan by Sheila Patel, which I would recommend to fans of My Year of Rest and Relaxation by Tessa Moshveg, because it's looking at art and social media, complex relationships, and has quite an unlikable narrator. I thought that this was uh, brilliant, wicked and brilliant. And then finally, before we move on to other piles of books next to me, there was The Bandit Queens by Perini Shroff, which was such a good time whilst also tackling important topics. It's about a woman called Gita who lives in a rural village in India. Everyone thinks that she killed her husband and she's very happy for people to think that because that provides her some kind of safety. People don't want to come near her. They're like, no, okay, you get on with your life and we'll leave you alone. She enjoys that. But unfortunately, that means that some women start coming to her saying, my husband's really abusive. I'd like to get rid of him too, please help me. And it gets her in a little bit of a mess. I thought this was a joy. I really did. And it made it onto my predicted shortlist for this year's Women's Prize. The shortlist is announced towards the end of April. And if you wanna hear, as I said, all of my thoughts on the books, I'll link that reading vlog in the description box down below. 
I did a separate one day reading vlog where I went to Richmond Park and we saw some deer and I listened to the audiobook of Briefly A Delicious Life by Nell Stevens. Again, that video is linked down below. Love this book so much, narrated by a 14 year old ghost, a girl who's been dead for over 300 years and then falls in love with a mortal woman. And yes, that sounds ridiculous, but it was great and I'd recommend it for fans of Woman Eating by Claire Coda, kind of both having this existential forever life crisis from the point of view of someone who was once a young girl frozen in a moment in time and how absolutely wild that is. Again, very moving in places, loved it. Narration was brilliant. Then I read two books for Patreon Book Club. Patreon, I'm sure you know, is a place where you can tip creators. And if you enjoy my channel and you have the means to throw a dollar or a pound in the tip jar, it's always very much appreciated because support over there allows me to keep creating free content for everybody here. And it funds my time making things accessible by making captions and all of that good stuff. So I'll link that down below. Um, every season we read one or two books. I put four books up for a vote. If the vote's super close, I'll read both. So that video will be going up this weekend as well the discussion video on Patreon so I'll just very briefly mention these here the two that we read for Winter Book Club were The Nakano Thrift Shop by Hiromi Kawakami translated from the Japanese by Alison Markham Powell this is my least favourite Kawakami that I've read so far and I was quite disappointed by it but I'm still glad to have read it. And then the other one that we read was The Museum of Wales You Will Never See by A. Kendra Green. And I will say that if you have read Names for the Sea by Sarah Moss, then I think you will really enjoy this one, which is looking at small museums that are scattered across Iceland. And um, it's very eccentric and I enjoyed it. So those are those two books. I also reread The Home Child by Liz Berry, which is her novel in verse, and it's about her great aunt Eliza Scholl, who was a home child. I knew nothing about the home children immigration scheme at all. We were not taught about it at school, um, and Liz traced some of her family history and realised that her great aunt Eliza had been sent away from the black country in the UK to Nova Scotia, away from her family. She was newly orphaned, but she had siblings and she was sent to work on a farm. She had no choice in the matter at all. And now it's thought that one in 10 people in Canada is descended from a home child, from these orphans who were shipped across to, shipped across to Canada and were forced to work. I don't know anything about it, which seems ridiculous. So I was really glad to learn more about that in this book. Liz has such a love of language and that comes across in all of her work. It feels like a lullaby almost, like she's singing to you. I interviewed Liz for Toast this month and I'll link that interview in the description box down below if you would like to hear more about this brilliant book. Then I read this, which is What Meets the Eye, The Deaf Perspective, edited by Lisa Kelly and Sophie Stone. This is an anthology mainly of poetry, but there's some fiction, non-fiction in here as well, um, by deaf authors and hard of hearing authors. I wanted to give this a shout out, one, because I've read it, but two, it's Disability Readathon in April, which is something that happens every year. And I have made plenty of videos in the past recommending books about disability, books specifically by disabled and deaf and chronically ill authors. I'll link those videos in the description box down below, but this was an anthology that had been sitting on my shelf for a while. It's introduced by Raymond Antrobus. There was some work in here that I really loved, some that I didn't love as much. That always happens with an anthology like this, which is not a problem. What I want from an anthology is really to feel as though it all comes together and makes sense, which it definitely does. And I want to discover writers whose work I've never heard from before, if possible, because then I can go ahead and read more of their stuff. And the poet in here whose work I love the most was a poet called Kando Langri, who I'd never heard of before. She is a Tibetan poet who now lives in the States. And this is the beginning of her poem. A tree falls in the forest and I am there to make sure no one hears it. Beloved, it's not that I am unwilling to be seized by sound every day, I am undone by it. There are no batteries small enough for my hands for the bee gently drumming the glass pane with its body. I loved it and there were lots of other poets in here whose work I really enjoyed as well. 
Speaking of poetry, I read a book published by Tilted Axis. This is Sergius Seeks Bacchus by Norman Erickson Pasaribu, which is translated from the Indonesian by Tiffany Tsao. This I much preferred to his fiction. I read his collection, Happy Stories Mostly, last year when it was long listed for the International Booker and I enjoyed it, but I loved this poetry. Here are a couple of lines. In the mother's mouths swim the kids. We don't eat the mothers, the mothers don't eat the kids. The lake gives it all a nice blue touch. The grass gives it all a nice green touch. The fireflies offer themselves as lights. Every night we set up a big screen. Men and women come to watch movies about themselves filmed with hidden cameras. I would recommend this for fans of Ocean Vong's poetry. Thematically, they explore similar things, um, looking at motherhood, looking at queerness. Really, really enjoyed this book. Then I read Three Fairlight Moderns, and unfortunately, I didn't love any of them, so I'm not gonna dwell on them here. I have had a hit and miss success rate with the books that they publish. They publish these beautiful pocket-sized books, and some of them I think are brilliant, and others, I, I, they feel to me like they need quite a bit of work. And the three titles that I read from them this time um, just weren't my cup of tea. So there was Atlantic Winds by William Prendeville. This one just felt a bit othering, like um, The Virgin Suicides by Jeffrey Eugenides kind of looking at the teenager life of girls in quite an uncomfortable way that I didn't like. Minutes from Miracle City by Omer Saba, I thought did a similar thing to one of the books actually that's been long listed for the International Booker and I thought that did it much better. This one wasn't really for me. And The Driveway Has Two Sides by Sarah Marchant didn't get on with the writing style of this one either. Um, but if you're looking for a book that they published that I loved, I recommend The Therapist by Niall Giacomelli, one of my favorite books a couple of years ago adored it and when I mentioned that I hadn't loved books by them that I'd read recently some of you recommended some of your favorites so I'm going to head to those ones next and hopefully I will enjoy that more. I also finished reading Crying in H Mart by Michelle Zauner. I started reading this one I think in November when I was doing a reading vlog reading your favorite books. I'll link that again down below. So much linking going on and I loved this book. I would say I would have loved it more if I hadn't been ridiculous and put it down in November and then come back to it several months later. When you do that with most books, the book is gonna suffer. That's my problem, it's not the books at all. And um, yeah, this is a, a wonderful book and I listened to it on audio. It's Michelle talking about her relationship with her mum and how it changed over time. Their final few months together when she was trying to reconnect with her mum and they were making lots of food together. And then her relationship with her father after her mum's death and how difficult that was. I would very much recommend this. It is a very difficult book to read in places, but if you feel as though you can handle those topics of um, death and grief, then I would recommend it. Now we're on to the final very big pile of books here. And these are all from three different videos. And I think I'm gonna go through these even quicker than the ones I have gone through before because I have talked about these elsewhere. So I went to the New Forest for a long weekend with Mr. M and I took six books with me. Two of those books ended up being DNFs. One of those was Owlish by Dorothy Tse, which is translated from the Chinese by Natasha Bruce. It's set in a reimagined Hong Kong. It's playing around with E.T. Hoffman's work. I just didn't felt as though it particularly paid off. Then there was Chinatown by Tuan, which is translated from the Vietnamese by Win An Lee. This one I wanted to love so much, but I just could not get into it. It is very stream of consciousness, and for the most part, it doesn't have any paragraphs at all. And I would very much recommend this to fans of Anna Burns' Milkman. I think they're very similar in the way that they are told, though subject matter wise, they are different. It's just the style is similar. And I couldn't get to grips with Milkman either, even listening to it on audio. I couldn't fall in love with it in the way I wanted to. This was very sad, but I hope other people fall in love with this. I was thrilled to really enjoy Miss Ice Sandwich by Miko Kawakami, translated from the Japanese by Louise Heal Kawai, because I haven't enjoyed her work in the past, but I thought this was such a wonderful little book where lots of things were explored, but it felt as though it came together beautifully, and I didn't feel as though I was hit over the head thematically, which I often feel like I am with her books. It was very well balanced. I loved it. 
I didn't love Voyager by Nona Fernandez, which is translated from the Spanish by Natasha Wimmer, as much as I had hoped. I found this a little bit earnest in places. It is autofiction. I would recommend it for fans of Sight by Jesse Greengrass, which I enjoyed more, but it's looking at the um, secular nature of motherhood and passing the baton on and also incorporating political themes as well. I like some parts of this, but just overall, I didn't love it. I read a thriller called I Let You Go by Claire McIntosh, which, you know, hit the spot when I read it, but I wouldn't say it's anything to write home about. And I read a short story collection by Meng Jin called Self Portrait with Ghosts. There were a couple of stories in here that I really enjoyed, and I would definitely like to read other things by her, perhaps a novel instead of a short story. Then I read some of the Man Booker nope, <laughs> some of the international booker long list. It was a real mixed bag. One I really didn't like was Whale by Chong Myung Kwan, which is translated from the Korean by Chi Young Kim. This is a satire, but I just found it quite immature and, and very sexist as well. I just I didn't enjoy that. Then I read The Gospel According to the New World by Maurice Conde. I liked what it was setting out to do. This a retelling, reimagining of um, a Bible story of a man who's been told that he is the son of God. But I thought that the idea didn't sustain itself throughout the whole book. Um, then we had Standing Heavy by Goz, which is translated from the French by Frank Wynne. This is the book that I mentioned saying that it did what A Fair Like Modern was trying to do more successfully. This is set across three different time periods and it's looking at the lives of security guards. Um, and these are immigrants who have come to Paris and they are trying to protect capitalism. They have been put in control of stores or of disused warehouses and they're seeing how these places are more revered, more looked after, more cared for than they are as individuals and how ridiculous that is. I really like the social commentary in this book. Next, there was Still Born by Guadalupe Nettle and this is translated from the Spanish by Rosalind Harvey. This is a book about motherhood. In fact, the top three books from this year's longlist for me were all about motherhood. So there's this one, which is looking at IVF and disability, friends having children, your lives separating, navigating complex relationships and mothering in all different forms. This is quite a difficult book to read because of the subject matter, but I did enjoy it. Then we had Boulder by Eva Balthasar, translated from the Catalan by Julia Sanchez. Again, this is looking at mothering, but from a queer perspective, and again, has quite complex, sometimes dislikable characters in it. It's looking at the nature of, um, of need and want and how lives can completely separate when you don't communicate properly. And then my favorite from the list was Is Mother Dead by Victor Short, and it's translated from the Norwegian by Charlotte Barsund. It's about a woman who is an artist. She has left Norway and, well, had left Norway and is now coming home after many decades to reconnect with her family and put on a retrospective of her work. And she's trying to work out whether her memories of her family are accurate but she doesn't know how to establish whether or not that's true. And it's about the gap between our memories and truth and how that's different depending on who's doing the remembering. And it is paralleling that with art and artistic intent and what we get from, say, a painting and whether or not that's what the painter wanted us to get from it and whether that's important. I really love how all of those themes tangled up together. I thought it was wonderful. It's one of my favorite books from all of the books that I've talked about today. And that's, oh, that's it. No, I lie, I forgot to talk about the last five books that I read most recently, which were some of the oldest books on my TBR. As you may be able to hear, my voice is kind of going. So <laughs> I think I will just link that video in the description box down below. None of these were favorites from this particular period. I enjoyed reading Frankenstein and Baghdad the most. In that video, I also read Please Look After Mother by Kyung Suk Shin, Death or Ice Cream by Gareth P. Jones, The Lumberjack's Dove by Jenna Rose Nethercott, and Large Animals by Jess Arndt. Um, but yes, no favorites located in that video. All right, let me find my top 10 from the past couple of months. I have very quickly assembled this 10, so maybe I'll look back on this list and have regrets later, but 
In this particular moment, these are my top 10. Sergio Seeks Bacchus by Norman Erickson Passaribu, Memphis by Tara M. Stringfellow, The Bandit Queens by Perini Shroff, I'm a Fan by Sheena Patel, Briefly A Delicious Life by Nell Stevens, Children of Paradise by Camilla Gadrova, Wandering Souls by Cecile Pinn, Miss Ice Sandwich by Mika Kawakami, Boulder by Eva Balthazar, and Is Mother Dead by Victor Short. Those are my top 10 from the last couple of months. And thank you very much for joining me for this slightly chaotic video. Anything I can list and link will be in the description box down below. If you're new to my channel and you would like to subscribe, that would be lovely. And if you enjoy my content and you would like to consider supporting me on Patreon, that would be very kind. Link to that is also down below. As I mentioned, support on there allows me to keep creating free content for everybody and is extremely helpful. So thank you very much. I hope that you're all doing okay. I'd love to know what you've been reading recently. Let me know in a comment down below. And I'm sending lots of love. I'll see you next week. Bye.